Good afternoon. My name is Justin Villar with the Committee of 70, and welcome to another edition of Philly Youth Vote uh, takes over Studio C70 in advance of the November 3rd general election. Uh, this afternoon, we are excited to have uh, Dr. Nina Ahmed, uh, who is running for Pennsylvania Auditor General, uh, and she's going to be interviewed uh, by multiple students uh, from both Girls High and Central High School here in Philadelphia. So I'm going to pass it over, uh, over to uh, Ms. Lisa sheldon Majay, uh, who is going to be introducing uh, the candidate and the students. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ms. sheldon Majay from Central High School. Um, we are very honored to be here today with Dr. Nina Ahmed, who would be a, a groundbreaking uh, candidate for PA Auditor General. We are uh, going to have questions coming from a few members of the central debate team. First, uh, Rose Whalen, and second, Maxwell Getty. And then I will hand it over to Mr. Sikic, who will introduce the students from Girls High. Yes, hi there. My name is uh, Chris Sikic. Uh, I teach at Girls High, and we will have uh, Brooklyn Jones and Amina Wag from Girls High. And I'm uh, Tom Quinn from Central High School. We're gonna have Shay Street and Zion Sykes from the Central Voter Registration Team. Thank you. So Rose, if you're ready, you can have the first question. All right, so to start off with, um, can you briefly tell us a little bit about your background, education and experience? Okay, first I wanted to say thank you to all of you for taking time. Um, you are, you repudiate everything people say about your generation, your Gen Z. Um, and also I would say the generation before you, um, you are our fast, fastest growing electric. And just to have you on here um, gives me great pleasure to tell all the fuddy daddy old heads that you're wrong and young people are fully engaged. I also want to thank your teachers who, uh, and especially Mr. Quinn, um, you know, I've been here before, not with all of you, but uh, in one of his classrooms. And I, I thought that was one of my best experiences talking to future leaders, not even future leaders of today uh, who are taking the baton and uh, showing us the way in many, many a time. So thank you for having me. Uh, my experience, um, is very, very broad, <laughs> what I bring to the table. And uh, I believe this office is a leadership position. And so uh, what I bring to the table is having uh, been a leader in many different spaces. Uh, first of all, my education is, I am a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in chemistry, did a molecular genetics postdoc, uh, worked at Will's Eye Hospital, um, and really understood the value of information equals power paradigm and how do you make uh, data actionable. That's what I bring from my scientific background. Uh, I served as deputy mayor in Philadelphia and I established the Office of Public Engagement. I deeply believe that if you're going to trust your government, uh, which you must, uh, you can only do it if you know what they're doing with your money <laughs> and doing for you in your name. So having that public trust comes from having engagement. So I also want to make sure that department had people who, who were gonna be impacted by policy be at the table when that policy was being put together, not at the end when it's just being rolled out, uh, when it doesn't work. I think to be sustainable, you have to be the architects if you're closest to the pain. Um, and also I had the opportunity uh, to be, you know, I was a cabinet member and we were tasked for, with finding efficiencies in the budget. It, at that time, it was over $4 billion. And that's what taught me that the budget was a moral document, you know, who gets left in and who gets left out. This office that I am running for is also about making efficiencies, about saying, how can we best use your dollar? So I find that background is very helpful to me as I look at the role in this office. And finally, um, you know, I served in a, phys a, a civic capacity and our local community trust, which is one of the largest uh, in Southeast Pennsylvania, the Philadelphia Foundation. And I was a grant making chair there for a while and as well as served on the investment committee. And that uh, was taking a very established sort of very, um, a cons I would say very traditional organization and pushing it in directions uh, to invest in communities uh, where the need was, but actually introducing communities to that sort of organization and making sure dollars were spent there, uh, as well as safeguarding the five hundred million dollar endowment that they have. And my most 
uh, I, I would say the most um, important experience is that of an advocate. Um, I have been an advocate for women and marginalized communities, I would say uh, from a little girl because I lived through a war where we were being silenced and literally killed. I come from a small country called Bangladesh and lived through the war of independence. And that taught me that freedom comes at a very high price. And I stand in the sacrifice of many there. And when I came here, um, when I was 21, I came here, uh, I learned that I, my rights actually were um, afforded to me because of the work of many before me, particularly the African-American community. So those are the things that inform me and I currently serve as uh, a board member in the National Organization for Women and I used to be a local chapter president. So I'm sorry that's such a long, long background. Um, but uh, those are the kind of things that I bring to this job where I want to look at the data we collect in this office to see not only to make sure we have transparency, accountability, and we you know, spend the money legally, there's no fraud and abuse, but most importantly, to see how equitably those dollars are distributed. And you know, the school district, the school funding is something we find there's a lot of inequity, and I want to go in there and really look why and how do we make those changes, and what are the recommendations we give uh, the governor and the legislature around these issues, and to the public. I'm done. <laughs> um, Brooklyn, I think you're up for the next question. Um, hi. Hi. Um, my question is, why are you running for the position of Auditor General? So as I said, I am really interested in equity uh, because I come from the background I just said, where I saw what it means to be marginalized and when I, and I've lived in Philadelphia close to 37 years now, and I see we have great pockets, pockets of prosperity and then a lot of sustained uh, inequity. And I want, as a scientist, I'm really interested, what are the mechanisms that cause that to happen? And how can we in government actually uh, change those structures so that we have you know, more equity in all spaces across the board. I believe that, um, you know, government is there to do public good. And I use a hashtag in my campaign that says, leave no one behind. And when you marry the two, doing public good and leaving no one behind, you have a government that sees and serves you. We are your public servants. So I believe we need to be much more accountable to all of you. Uh, each one of you are my bosses. Um, and I, I feel that having your voices at the table will make a government that really allows the leveling of the playing field, which is my primary driver in life is leveling playing fields. And I believe this independent office will allow me to do so. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, hi, my name is Amina. So my question is being endorsed by President Obama to become the next Auditor General for, for Pennsylvania, how do you plan to use your power to make a difference? So I was thrilled with that endorsement. <laughs> um, I actually had the good fortune of being appointed by him to serve on a commission, which was the Asian American Pacific uh, Islander Commission. And that allowed me to come up close to federal government to see when public policy is being made, if you are not at the table, it kind of doesn't reflect you. It doesn't, oops, is that my phone, sorry. Okay. Um, apologies. Um, somehow my phone is hooked up to all this. <laughs> uh, so, um, so yeah. So having that experience and seeing um, what government can do if you have representation, if you bring lived experience and you have a seat at the table, uh, you can actually shape some policy. I'll give you a quick example. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm an advocate for women and maternal mortality is a big issue. More women are dying at childbirth uh, now than they used to 25 years ago. And black women are dying three times more than white women. And I am, you know, all the research has shown its own, it's racism. It's plain and simple racism because it's not socioeconomic. It's not based on how much money you have um, and how much education you have. You all might have heard about Serena Williams who almost died giving 
birth through her first baby um, because she knew she had a C-section. She, she knew she had a, a propensity to get blood clots. And when they get to your lungs, that can be a real problem. And she asked for medication that would make sure she didn't clot and she needed a, a, a scan and they didn't give it to her. And you know, she asked and when it got so bad and she was coughing, her stitches opened up and got infected. They finally gave her what she needed. And it was six weeks later. This is, could have been handled in two days. And so not only it almost killed her, uh, it cost her as a new mother to have to deal with all this. And it was expensive. Uh, so you and I are all paying for this uh, at the end of the day if we are not listening to people who know them, their own bodies, right? This is about listening to people, whether you're a doctor or a teacher or a you know government official. Um, or a parent actually also. Uh, all of those things tell me that um, if we don't have people who bring certain lens to the table, you're gonna miss out on something. So that's why I want to uh, bring this broad experience and say, you know, what are the things that we could do that actually could make people's lives better? And that's why, uh, that's what I want to do. And that's, I actually see what, you know, President Obama continues to inspire me um, and, you know, having that sort of a rational approach using science and data to uh, address issues, uh, but never forgetting that each data point is someone's story. When he was in office along with Joe Biden, um, we had pandemic-like situations and none of you were we wearing masks and Zooming like this. That's because we had a pandemic playbook that was put together and was left for this administration to use, which they uh, threw away and they dismantled the CDC unit that was for pandemics. And we could have handled this. We, we wouldn't have had this economic disruption, educational disruption, and most importantly, people died. My own cousin died. In, in this COVID pandemic. He was a physician and he was attending to people who were um, seniors. Uh, he was a, um, a geriatric psychiatrist. He was a perfectly healthy person. And I can't still wrap my head around that he died. And it's, I think we just have to be, take it all very seriously that government has a responsibility. So those are all the reasons why I think um, I will bring not only my lived experience, but being a scientist, bring a certain kind of lens to uh, have government function better. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, given your experience in Philadelphia, you are aware of what goes into running a large office as a top executive leader. In what way do you see leading the office of the Auditor General as similar or different from that of your leadership in Philadelphia? So the Auditor General's office is now about 350 plus employees. Um, there used to be 800, <laughs> 800 plus. They're doing the same number of mandated audits, 8,000 or more. They used to when they had 800 people. So I know there's going to be, and I've been talking to people, they're very, very stressed because they have to do so much with so few people, right? And then we have all these special audits that we do on top of that, which really gives you a really, those are really focused, uh, uh, you know, sort of audits that people bring to our attention, the legislature asks us. So there's a lot of work to be done. So one of the ways I look at it is first to have uh, a coming together of all our employees because most of them don't have offices. They work out of their homes. They go to do audits in the field. There's no sense of, um, teamwork. There's no sense of understanding what the mission is. So I have to build that, that spirit of uh, working together and all of us pulling in the same direction to make sure we serve you, the Pen Pennsylvanians, uh, with the very best um, efforts that we can to use your tax dollars. So that's the first thing is to build morale, to have a sense of mission, to have a strategic vision for the office that has everybody giving some input. And, I, and that's, when I started off as a public engagement, that was the kind of model I used. And I actually built it on President Obama's Office of Public Engagement in the White House. Uh, and it's all about not just engaging you, the public, but is engaging people who actually work there and they should feel they have a stake. And if they see their um, suggestions or they, what they have said reflected in the structure of the office, I think we have a much 
healthier, cohesive team going forward. So that's one of the first things I want to do. And then I want to institute a data office. So we actually take the data and make it useful for you, uh, the legislators. And I think that will also help us streamline some of the things we do and reduce the busy work that those 350 plus employees do. I want to be able to use their capacity to think more than just do rote stuff. And if we can uh, make those, um, streamline those and uh, you know, maybe have some ways to collect that information in different manner, we could open up people's brains to do other stuff. So those are some of the things I'm thinking of how we move forward to use innovation and technology without forgetting people are at the end of it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Shayla and I'm part of Central's voter registration team. And our question is, what are your thoughts on reopening schools as COVID-19 continues to thrive in our communities? Philadelphia is one of the largest uh, school districts in the state. How will you ensure that the proper funding is in place for Philly schools to eventually reopen safely? Very good question. Uh, and, a, and not an easy question to answer because um, this virus seems to um, be very persistent. <laughs> but what we need to do as a nation, which would help all of us here, is to have extensive um, testing, to have contact tracing, and to have PPEs. If we had invested in this, I don't think we would have been facing what we are, even with this virus, this virility of this virus. Um, so one of the things we can do in the pu public school system to make sure there are resources available to do exactly that for the school community. So we know, uh, you know what's happening to a particular student, what they, who they're in contact with, if they were to be exposed so we can keep the rest of you safe. So coming back to school in person would require us to have those safety measures in place so that we are cleaning and you know, right now, even with the, our, some of our older schools, um, they're so decrepit. I don't know if you go to clean them, they'll fall apart. So we really need to have much better resources for all of you. Um, the state of Pennsylvania is 47th in its investment in, 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 in our schools. That's abysmal. Um, and that's because, and, and that the reason why we have some school districts that do much better than others Philadelphia is way behind, we are underfunded um, because much of the money comes from property taxes and places that have high value property obviously have more money. So we have a formula fund that's not being used appropriately. Um, so those, all of those things are things that I would advocate for, but more importantly right now, when we're faced with this pandemic, we really have to look at the safety concerns and uh, these can't, cannot be unfunded mandates, meaning we can't say the government cannot tell you to do things and then not fund it, right? So we have to work with the federal government as well to make sure there's money that's coming in because, you know, and hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have a different administration that believes in public safety, believes in science. And then I want to make sure they can't just tell us do this make sure they put some money behind it. So we're hoping that we can mobilize some money for, from federal government, from the state. Uh, this, this is where the job of the Auditor General becomes really important, looking for efficiencies. Um, there are things like, we have something called a game commission in the state of Pennsylvania. That is sitting on $72 million that they have made, they haven't even booked properly. So I want to scan and see where all these different pots of money is sitting. Uh, within a certain department or a commission and mobilize that and put a needs list together. And you would be at the front of that list because you are the most important of our resources is our, 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 you are the young people, right? If we don't invest in you, we're telling you you're not important, we don't care about you. So I want to challenge the government to say, how are you going to tell the leaders that are in the, these Philadelphia schools, like all of you, how are you gonna send them the message that we really deeply care and love them? That's going to be to make sure your schools are safe, you can come back. Second, if we have to stay at home, we wanna make sure that our broadband is working. We have high speed broadband. You have access to it, meaning if anybody is not able to afford, first of all, 
that's a whole other conversation about it being a public utility, but we won't go there today. Um, it's about making sure you have access to the internet, you have a laptop that works, you have resources to be learning distantly. We already don't do that. And we are making people, uh, you know, really uh, have to deal, come to the parking lots to get their hotspots. That's nonsense. If you're gonna ask you to study, then we must give you the tools. We are a first world country with the largest economy in the world. If we cannot invest in you, shame on us. So I will be very forceful about saying, I have a 20 year old who is not, you know, a little bit older than all of you. And um, I can just imagine how her high school would have been if she had to do it like you are doing it. So I, I applaud all of you for staying engaged, but you will have a champion in me um, saying that let's put our money where our mouth is. If we really care and love our children, let's show it and keeping you safe in a pandemic. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, hi, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, my name is Zion. I'm also a part of Essentials Voter Registration Team. And my question to you is, um, seeing that Philadelphia is currently the poorest big city in the US and the homeless population is very large. As Auditor General, uh, how do you make sure that state funds are afforded to uh, Philadelphia and improve these conditions? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the state actually funnels a lot of federal dollars for housing. Um, part of the issue in government in general is mobilizing things. Sometimes the money is there, but the, the structures that allow the money to go to where it needs to go needs to be fine-tuned. There's a lot of bureaucracy, we call that bureaucracy. And um, we need to really streamline that so the money gets to people where they need it. Um, we have to give the data to our legislators and our uh, executive branch to say, when we allow homelessness to happen in Philadelphia, we allow it to be there and we don't attend it, it actually causes harm to our revenue base. Because when someone is homeless, the stress they're under, first of all, if they're homeless because they lost a job or they're homeless because they have a mental illness, there are different reasons for being homeless. Uh, maybe they have an addiction issue, all of those things. These are things that we have to understand where the homelessness is coming from. Um, when someone is homeless, you, their whole life is disrupted. If they have children, their lives are disrupted. Everybody is an economic unit. You know, if person is properly housed, has food and shelter, you know that person can be a part of our economic engine. When we shut that down by stressing people and not having resources, um, they're not being able to participate in the economy. So right there is the value proposition to say, it is actually economically better to have uh, people have house, housing and shelter, right? So. And, and if you start from that frame and you work backwards, that where's the money? How do we get it to them? So it's actually getting to people, not being lost in 10 different layers of bureaucracy. Uh, and what are those system changes we need? And that's what I, what I can do, send as recommendations by deconstructing these systems to say, these are where the roadblocks are, let's move them. Because that, that is how fast the money will get to the people. That's how fast people can have shelter, because I think shelter is a human right. And uh, again, as I said, as a first world country, we tout ourselves to the whole world that we have the most booming economy, except it doesn't seem to reach certain people. Then there's a parallel set of things we have to do um, that has been standing in the way, particularly in the lives of uh, people of color. In this country, I'll give you a quick example, and I know we're running out of time, but um, so when after the Second World War, the GI people who uh, had fought in it, um, the GIs got some benefits. White GIs were able to get loans to buy homes. Black GIs were not. So right there, you set up, you know, both of them shed the same blood on those battlefields, worked as hard as anybody else. But when they came home, they did not get those benefits. So the white family who bought a house and when it was time to send their, so they were building wealth, um, and when they had, was time to send their children to school or you know, wherever they needed to, they could you know, leverage their house to get resources. When you have a black family who wants to do all those same things and they don't have any assets to leverage, 
you have already at a disadvantage with, with no, no reason except for race, right? So we, those are the barriers we have to dismantle in government. They still exist today. You're just watching what's happening uh, with our police brutality issues. Those are, all need to be dismantled. We all need to take these racial and gender justice lens on how our government dollars are spent. So again, I know you asked me about housing, but all of these are interconnected. You know, you can't do one without the other. So we have to have a very holistic view of saying, what is wrong and what are those barriers? Let's dismantle them. And I am going to be one who's going to look and show all of you what those barriers are and how they stand in the way for people driving their own destiny. Because I believe everybody has the capability of doing that. Our job is to give those tools. Our job is to not create barriers. And then, you know, people want to do whatever they want to do. So um, housing falls into that perspective as well. Thank you so much for that answer. You're welcome. Um, hi, Ms. Ahmad. I have a sort of question for like a 30 second response type of thing. Um, why do you think it's important for young people to vote? Because you are voting for your future. If you don't vote the right people in, uh, we're going to be making laws or creating structures that may not reflect your needs. So you need to do your homework like you're doing just now uh, to see who's going to have you at the table when we make policy or we spend our money. Um, one of the things I want to do is create a pandemic pre preparedness audit. And that will have an economic component, an educational component, and a health component. I actually want a representation from you, your, your maybe hopefully your schools, uh, and some of you on this call to come to that uh, table to tell me what is it you experienced so that we have those built into our audit to assess whether places are ready. My older daughter lives in New York. Um, she's graduated from high school, uh, college and she's working and she's actually planning to go back to med school. Um, she worked in New York, which is the hottest spot. And she told me her experiences of what she did. You know, they had a volunteer organization that provided uh, the personal protective equipment, PPEs. She came home many years, months later, I didn't see her for a while because she was in the hotspot and said one of the things she did was move uh, people who died of COVID from the, in the hospital, uh, from the hospital into refrigerated trucks because they were waiting to you know, dispose them and how carefully that had to be done. When I planned that preparedness audit, I have to think about that eventuality as well and make sure we're prepared. But if I did not talk to people who were doing that work, I would not include that. That's how your voice, when you're going to tell me what are the issues you faced going to school remotely, or what are the things you thought might work better, I want to include those in the assessment of our departments. Are we delivering that? Um, so yeah, <laughs> lots of work to do. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, we really appreciate you coming in and talking about why it's so important to vote. Lots of reasons there. I um, want to thank, uh, real quick, um, Committee of 70, uh, um, Ms. Sheldon Mage from Central, Mr. Sigage from Girls High, and the Central and Girls High students uh, for doing the interview. Do you have any last words before we? Uh... Yes, just to finish off why, why it's important for them to vote is because, you know, a lot of people died for you and I to have this ability to vote, particularly those of us of color and women. Um, so you, you know, uh, Representative John Lewis had just died. He got his head bashed in. He got dogs set on him. He got water hoses on him. People actually died, black and white died when they went to register people to vote. So you and me are standing in their sacrifice. Just if nothing else, honor their sacrifice and make sure that you go vote because as I said, your future depends on it, but you know, it's, a, it's honoring your past. It's honoring whose shoulders you stand on. So it's very, very important uh, we vote because that's our voice. Uh, and if we don't vote, we can't guarantee what's going to happen in the future. So I want to thank all of you. I hope 
I don't know how many of you are, reg are, have, are able to vote, uh, you're of voting age or if you're registered, I hope you'll consider voting for me. Um, I hope you'll take a look at my website, ninaforpa.com. Uh, and I hope whether I you know, win this or not, I hope I get to meet with you again in some capacity because I think you guys are so valuable and um, I think I need, we need to all work together uh, to make change in our city, in our state and in our country. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you too, absolutely. It doesn't stop after the election. That's right. We just, we just heard from uh, Dr. Nina Ahmad, Democratic candidate for Auditor General. And uh, just so you know, there, um, there you can find out about more. Can about I leave? Ahmad. Yep, go ahead. Oh yes, you can leave. Uh, I was saying, uh, I can leave. So I'm sorry I have to leave. I have to hop on to something else. So sure, thanks right. everyone for having me. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. So you can find out more about Dr. Ahmad and other candidates at wevote.70.org. Um, and you can drop off your ballot if you have a mail-in ballot at one of the satellite election offices. There's a list here, as well as uh, a link to find your polling place. And if you want to get help, if you want to get um, help out with uh, getting other young people to vote, there's a number of different organizations that are doing it. So have a great afternoon, everyone, and we'll see you at the polls.